Good morning, church. It's good to see you on this crisp fall morning and greet you in the name of Jesus Christ and welcome you to worship. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Today, uh, you'll see behind me here this beautiful spray of flowers. These are from the service that we had yesterday. To remember the life of our heart. Those are from this family. And this arrangement here is from our missions committee in memory of Martin. We celebrated his life here yesterday afternoon and uh, had a reception afterwards. And there was quite a bit of food left over. So the surprise that you get is Connections Cafe. So, yes, we will have our uh, first in-person Connections Cafe. So if you would like a bite of something to eat and some refreshments after worship, you can just go down the hall and uh, enjoy that. I want to say a very, very special thank you to all of the ladies under Kenny Sue Robertson's leadership who helped put all that together. Thank you. That was not easy. And thank you to our tech team who had to do things yesterday. Uh, the first time you come back together to do a large service with a lot of different components after more than a year and a half is very challenging. So thank you to everyone who put that together yesterday. I know uh, that Martin's family greatly appreciated it, and I know that many of you were very glad to see the entire family and uh, Reverend Clark Carr as well yesterday. We also want to keep in prayer uh, the family of Esther Samakouris. Esther passed away uh, earlier this week, and she's having um, a private service, but there will be public visiting hours on Tuesday uh, over at Molesworth Williams. They'll be from 6 to 8 p.m. this Tuesday evening. So uh, if you're able, encourage you to stop by and give your condolences to the family or drop a note uh, to Ted at home. I also want to ask you particularly, uh, in addition to the other persons that you see listed at the bottom of page three, to please keep Patty Long in your prayers. Uh, she had to have emergency surgery this week uh, that was very lengthy. She's at Holy Cross Hospital in Silver Spring. I hope to be able um, that they will let me visit her this afternoon. So please keep Patty in your prayers uh, as she recovers from that emergency surgery. There is always joy in our midst as well. You will see a new baby welcomed into the world, Eleni Rebecca, who was born to Christina and George Moshogianis. I hope I have said that correctly. Uh, her grandparents are uh, Ted and Sue Constantinides and uh, Mike and Marula Moshogianis. She uh, joins her uh, older twin brothers, and the family is very thankful that it was a safe birth. Everyone is doing well. So congratulations on that new life in our midst. Just a couple other things to highlight. There's a labyrinth ministry forming. Of course, our beautiful labyrinth. Many people used it during the pandemic when we could not gather inside. Some people found it very helpful to be able to walk the labyrinth. If you're interested in participating in that ministry, you'll see the details there on how you can participate. I want to see Kalnowski if you'll give us some details about tonight's youth event. It's on. Good morning. Good morning. So tonight, uh, I am hosting a bonfire, cookout, choir, little retreat uh, event at our, our house in Frederick. It's been a good 10, 12 years since we've uh, hosted something. Uh, where the church came over. Uh, so that is at 5.30. Um, I bought all this firewood last year for tour that we were gonna burn on a uh, kind of like a beach uh, uh, fire pit uh, in Ocean City and it ended up raining all day. Uh, so I saved it for a special occasion. We're burning all of that tonight. 
uh, so it'll be quite glorious. Uh, so 5.30, uh, we have the friendliest German Shepherd you will ever meet. Come pet our dog, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we'll have some um, uh, singing. Uh, there's gonna be some ultimate Frisbee on our, we have a, like two or three acres that we can have ultimate Frisbee on, so 5.30 tonight. And the uh, bus uh, for the youth leaves here at five o'clock, and thanks for Pastor B for uh, driving out there. Note also that uh, next Saturday, that there will be an opportunity for you to participate in the ministry at Laytonsville Safe Haven. You'll see the full page information about that here. That's happening next Saturday from nine to four. If you can, uh, you'll see all the details there. They do need a head count. So if you plan to participate, please let Doug Marshall know. I wanna invite Cora, if she will, at this time to come forward for our special presentation this morning. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. I'm Cora Hurst. I'm our children's ministry director and I have some very special guests that I can see are very eagerly awaiting to come in and meet you under the direction of their fearless leader, Gloria Moretti. Our puppets are here to meet you all this morning. Why do you always come here? I guess we'll never know. It's like a kind of torture to have to watch the show. But now let's get things started. Why don't you get things started? It's time to get things started with the most sensational, inspirational, celebrational. to lead the puppeteers or the, the puppet ministry. Um, I've never done anything like this. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna need your help, everybody's help. I need ideas, what went on in the past. Maybe teachers here can give me some ideas of what can I do to make this fun, exciting, educational, and stay with you know the theme of Jesus and God. Um, so today I'm here uh, to present the children and the puppets. Um, the children named the puppets because I thought that they needed a name. I don't know if they ever had a name before, but this time we named them. So um, as I said, um, I'm hoping that everybody will help me um, be part of this ministry. I'll need some good ideas, some fresh ideas. And I know there's plenty of them here. So I'm going to introduce the children now. So good morning. Can you tell us your name? My name is Dawn Brooklyn, and my puppet's name is Grace. Great. Good morning. I'm Miss Joan, and my puppet's name is Lily. My name is Ivan, and this is Millie. Good morning, Millie. Hello. My, my name is Graham, and this is John. John. Oh, excuse me. Good morning. My name is Eleanor, and this is Sarah. My name is Kelsey and this is Emma. Alright. My name is Elizabeth and this is Gloria. This is Gloria. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Georgia and my puppet's name is Serafina. Now Serafina, that's a great name. My name is Nan and this is Stephanie. You're right. So that's it. There you go. Thank you. We are called to joyful obedience in God's realm.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Jesus, our teacher, we dare not make demands of you. Unlike James and John, we do seek the honor of sitting beside you in glory. We ask only that you make our hearts the seat of your presence, that we might serve your purpose as passionately as we have served our own. Strengthen our faith, our love, and our discipleship, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You join with me as we pray the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. Our epistle lesson comes from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. It reads, Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifice for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Oh! 
initiate God and one God who offers grace and God who is compassionate and I am I believe that we can amend a prayer <laughs> when we offer it to God so in our opening prayer on like James and John we do not seek honor to sit of sitting beside Jesus in glory our gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 10 35 through 45. Mark 10, 35 through 45. You stand for the reading of the gospel. It reads, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. He said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in glory. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be the first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the gospel of our Lord. In this passage from Mark's gospel, we get one last good look at the disciples before Jesus's entry into Jerusalem in chapter 11. Now they've been with Jesus for several years at this point as he has taught and healed and prayed and fed people. They have been with him day in and day out. And now their time with him is nearing an end as he prepares to enter Jerusalem where he will be arrested and crucified before he is resurrected and ascends. Now, the question is, during these several years with Jesus, their rabbi, their teacher, have they come to understand what type of kingdom it is that Jesus wants to bring in? Do they understand that the kingdom or reign of God is not like any earthly kingdom that has come before? Do they understand that they too are called to take up the cross? And what about Jesus's concern for the little ones or the least of these? Well, let's take a look at this passage that Pastor B just read for us. Have you ever said something and then immediately regretted saying it? Yes, I have. Uh, <laughs> Have you ever let something just pop right out of your mouth unfiltered and then realized, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I just said that? Well, I'm kind of wondering if that was how James and John, the sons of Zebedee, felt after asking Jesus for a, fa for a favor. Or I'm kind of wishing that's how they felt because it, it isn't. You can tell they, they were not embarrassed about this question that they asked. 
They don't ask Jesus if he will show them how to heal someone or how they might improve their prayer life or, you know, how they can feed the masses. Instead, they ask how a personal favor for themselves. James and John, two of the disciples who were among the first to be called part of the inner circle, ask something seemingly outrageous. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Well, now that sounds a little bit like something your six-year-old might ask you, just slightly differently, you know. Do, do you, if I ask you, will you do this for me? And, you know, usually you have to say, well, I have to hear it first. You know, it's kind of like, Jesus promised you'll do what I ask. Can we pinky swear on this? Well, Jesus is a patient teacher. And he, perhaps he was intrigued by what this question was going to be. I, I picture him asking the brothers kindly, what is it you want me to do for you? And it's clear that he already senses that this is something completely about them. Because he does ask, what do you want me to do for you? Well, it's foot in mouth time again for these two disciples who want to sit in the places of honor. They respond by saying, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in the places of honor right next to you. One at your right, one at your left. Well, to make sense of what seems like kind of a nonsensical request, it helps to know something about the structure of Mark's gospel. These chapters in the middle of Mark's gospel, chapters 8 through 10, here Mark is painting a picture of the disciples as only understanding in part whom it is they're following. And I won't bore you with the deep details of how these stories are laid out. There are about five or six of them in these two chapters, but there's a very clear pattern to the stories that is meant to highlight the disciples' confusion. Peter, ever the leader, is the first one to get Jesus' identity right, to understand correctly who he is. At the end of chapter 8, Jesus asks all the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, you are the Messiah. Peter knows Jesus is the Messiah. Now, he doesn't understand fully what this means. The disciples are the very first followers of Jesus. They see him for who he is, they get he is the Messiah, but they don't have all the details correct yet about what that means. James and John understand that Jesus is the real deal. He is the Messiah, but they don't understand the nature of what this means for them as followers. Now, I think most of us have heard that there are no stupid questions, and there probably aren't, but there definitely are some awkward questions. Not long before James and John put this question to Jesus, he has said to his disciples, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. So why did they ask this thing about, you know, practically next? Oh, and, and by the way, can we sit at your right and your left hand in glory? Mark tells us they did not understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask him about it. How often do we feel that way? Sometimes we just don't get it, but we're afraid 
to ask, to dig deeper, to really figure it out more. So they just go ahead and move right on, skip over that part about suffering and death and resurrection and just ask the question, the easier one that, that seems perhaps a lot more palatable. How about, how about if we just sit next to you in glory? Let's, let's skip over suffering and death. Nobody wants to be part of that. Let's, let's get to the glory part. Well, maybe James and John had a banquet in mind, sitting on the right and left hand of Jesus at a banquet celebrating his rise to power. And the fact that Jesus responds with a reference to drinking the cup that he is about to drink points in that direction. If so, then there is a painful irony Later in the story, as Jesus on the cross is offered a sponge with sour wine to drink. Similarly, asking to be on Jesus' right and left side is also ironic since, as we know, later in the story, two bandits are crucified with Jesus. Where? One on the right side, one on the left of Jesus. Well, it's very clear to us as readers and hearers of Mark's gospel what's going on here and who Jesus is. But of course, it's not clear to the disciples who are characters in Mark's story. The disciples think they know who Jesus is and why he has come, but they don't have it yet in full. And because of that, they're not quite f sure what it means to follow Jesus entirely. Jesus is, as he tells James and John after their request, a servant Messiah. And to follow a servant Messiah means, obviously, you too need to serve. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now it would be easy for us just to kind of pick on James and John and chide them for their inability to hear the truth of Jesus' predictions of his suffering and death. But in truth, we don't always get it either. And I kind of wonder if maybe that was a little uh, Freudian slip as I was typing the bulletin to leave out that uh, not in that first prayer. Maybe, maybe I don't want to get in on that suffering part either. When the other disciples chime in, including Peter, who at one time got it, it's because they're upset that the sons of Zebedee are going to get something that they might miss out on. Jesus asked the brothers if they really knew what they were asking for. And they assure them that they do, they get it, they know. And Jesus tells them indeed, you will share the cup that I share, you will share in my baptism. But they don't quite know what that really means yet but he says it's not up to him who is seated with him in glory. Well, the other disciples are indignant. They're upset that James and John have already put in their bid for the best seats in the kingdom and tension mounts. And again, Jesus instructs his follower about the real nature of leadership in the reign of God, reminding them that it is the exact opposite of what the world values. No wonder they didn't understand. How could they expect this? The nature of leadership in the kingdom of God is servant leadership. It's not about climbing to the highest rungs and having other people serve you. It's about serving others. It's about being a servant to other people. When we read the Gospels, there Jesus is washing the feet of his disciples and Peter saying, Dad, you can't do that to me. 
But Jesus is modeling what it means. He's, he is acting as if he is the lowest servant in the household to do that job. In an essay on this passage, Sharon Blessard writes, Jesus invites us to join the Suffer Club as part of faithful and radical discipleship, to realize that in following him and in being part of the reign of God here and now, we open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to the realities of this beautiful yet broken world. No one gets out of life on earth alive, and suffering is a part of the fabric of life. The thing about being part of the Suffer Club is this. There is beauty, joy, and hope in serving others. Yesterday at Martin Carr's funeral, I talked about the way that service was really his, his life's vocation. He uh, worked for uh, WMATA, for Metro, for 35 years. That was you know, his vocation, his means of earning a living. But when people talked about Martin, I don't think anybody mentioned that yesterday. When he retired, he was the uh, station manager for the Shady Grove Metro Station. Nobody talked about that. They talked about what he did in service, how he did things both small, small things in the community, from making small things from wood for people to taking mission trips overseas to just talking in kindly ways to people about how he grew up very poor in West Virginia. He grew up on a sharecropper's farm uh, and moved from there when he was a young teen to uh, Chevy Chase, Maryland. And I, I said in my sermon, I can't imagine sort of what we would now call cognitive dissonance, but uh, going from a very poor place in West Virginia to Chevy Chase. I mean, even in the 1940s, you know, it's, it's as different then as it is now. And he could have very well left that behind and not thought about it again and just carried on with life. But what he told his family and others was that the way he grew up was very much uh, something that triggered his desire to serve others. All of us are called to servanthood in ways large and small, and it is not necessarily something we have to plan. It's often something that just presents itself right in front of us in the immediacy of our day. It might be a kind word to someone who is struggling. It might be just answering a call to help the way that a number of people did who were able to help put together uh, the reception this week for Martin's family and friends. It can be ways small and large that people don't even know. Servanthood doesn't have to be dramatic, and it doesn't always have to be filled with suffering. But servanthood is what Jesus calls us to be a part of and to join with one another in that means of service. Servanthood is our vocation. And I understand James and John very well. Sometimes we would just rather kind of be hanging out at the right and left of Jesus, enjoying things and not having to think about some of the difficulties of life or where we might really have to dig in hard and indeed at times participate in suffering. But my prayer is that each day for myself and all of us, we can listen for and discover that call to servanthood that Jesus offers us and to respond with a yes. Amen.
As we approach God in this time of prayer, I feel compelled to offer the invitation if you feel so moved that the altar is always open. We are one of the great things about the Methodism space for worship is we must have an altar. And there is no specific time that one has to wait for its use. But given the word that was proclaimed on this morning, I just want to offer that invitation to you that the altar is open if you need to approach God in that way. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to go before the Lord in prayer. Holy God, we approach your throne of grace this morning being reminded of your great power, creator of the universe, giver of life, redeemer of all humanity and sustainer for all who desire to continue to be in right relationship with you. We come with thankful hearts, O oh God, and with great adoration that we have the ability, O oh God, to come before you, wretched as we are, blemished as we are, but still being invited to call on you. This morning, God, we are also reminded that there is an unspeakable joy that is within us when we come to the knowledge of who you are, when we come to a realization of how we have experienced you, and when we come to the knowledge of your saving grace. This morning we pause within that great joy to reflect on what it truly means for us to share in the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus the Christ. We pause, O oh God, to reflect on what it means to share in the sacrifice for the sake of your good news to the world. Help us, God, strengthen us. Give us the grace of knowing that sometimes it calls for us to be uncomfortable, to relinquish, to shift, to adjust, to go through seasons of fatigue and dislike. It calls us to give up of ourselves. So we ask, God, that you reveal to us personally and collectively what it means for us to be in partner with you. How is it might you be calling us, O oh God, to make a shift or God to make a greater sacrifice, to partner with you, to bring the reality of your kingdom to the world. Thank you for hiring us <laughs> for this great vocation. Might we be reminded today of what it costs our Lord. And might we remind it today, O oh God, of the great joy that comes from working with you. God, in this time of prayer, we want to lift up before you all those who stand in the need of your healing. For those who are listed among our people to be prayed for, for the Carr family, we ask for comfort. For the Samakoris family, we ask for your comfort. 
for Jean Barr and Elizabeth Bradley and Beth Gorecki and Pam Hossamer and Dave Lingrell and Patty Long and Hazel McKenzie and Mary Nieder and Tina Sewell and Sharon Warfield and so many others on our hearts, we ask God your healing. Might we, God, be your servants that bring peace to this world and, O oh God, do all that we can so that wholeness are, is within our families and our community. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, who gave us permission to and taught us how to pray. When he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Hold me, rock me, call me.
prayer of dedication. Let us pray. God of all goodness and grace, receive the gifts we offer and grant that our whole life may give you glory and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. scattered church of Jesus Christ, serving all whom we meet and declaring through our word and deed that Christ is risen and God is love. Go forth in peace. Amen. Amen.